Welcome back to Rethinking Politics, episode 76. I'm here with Brad. Welcome back, Brad. You're here 76 episodes in a row. Thanks for having me, Dan. (laughs) I'm glad to be your favorite special guest. Brad is the co-host of this show who likes to pretend that none of it's his fault. Um, I stand by that. in In the news... There, there are some really interesting things that are happening in the news. Um, there are some, there's, there's something as usual we're going to, or as we generally do, I guess sometimes we do overviews in the news. We're going to go through some news here, but, uh, before we, uh, focus in on a couple things, um, so much of this is interesting. So much of this could, uh, we could do an entire episode on wipe that silly smile off your face. <laughs> <laughs> Brad's over there looking pleasant. It's a scam. Don't it's believe a lie. it for a second. <laughs> Nothing about him is pleasant. <laughs> Russia has been posturing on the Ukrainian border, or so the news says. Um, this has been in the news for some time. Uh, one of the interesting things, one, fun fact, wars generally increase the approval rating of the president. It gives them a lot of time and place to flex their muscles um, for a variety of reasons, and depending on where it is in the war and, of course, how popular the war is. But in general, military uh, interactions are good for the president. Mm -hmm. So there is some political incentive for people to make security issues up, right? for people to or to over overplay them or to draw extra attention to things that are otherwise mundane. And that's, there is some evidence that that is what's happening here. And that would be my suspicion. I, I think Russia invading Ukraine would be crazy for Russia. Like why, why would that be a good idea for them? How would that help them in the world? Now, maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe other things go crazy or several things happen at once. Mm -hmm. This in isolation, which is all we're hearing Mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any reason for Russia to do that. And that's what Ukraine thinks, too. If you look at Ukrainian reporters and what the Ukrainian people are saying, they're saying we're not seeing what the American news groups are saying and what the apparent government agencies are saying about Russia being a threat and preparing for an all-out invasion. Which is odd. Ukraine, it'd be like, this is the breaking points, uh, made this analogy, and it's a good one. It'd be like if Ukraine called us and said, Mexico is up to some things on your border. And we'd be like, we run the Mexico border. Like, we, we run the drug operations in Mexico, for that matter. <laughs> we would know if something were happening on the Mexico border, right? Like, like you don't need to tell us our business here. Um, you, obviously, we have more resources than Ukraine does, we, and we mm-hmm. have, and so there may be cases where we know things that they don't. Um, but as far as large military mobilizations that are a threat to their security, right there on their border, with the kind of numbers that you can simply look at a satellite photo or fly, a, you know, <laughs> take a, take mm-hmm. a picture, um, they should know. They should be aware of this. Uh, and so there's the, <laughs> there's some there were some really funny articles uh, that were talking about this the threat of Russia invading Ukraine. And at the bottom, it's like sponsored by Lockheed Martin. <laughs> and uh, it just, uh, just cracked me up. There, there's, there are reasons people lie about security stuff. There are reasons they mislead you. They make it seem like there's more things. It tends to improve the president's appearance. Um, please. I was say, and, and couple that with the fact that, that at least some of the posturing is on Russia's part. There are reasons to, to, yes, yes. to posture as if you're going to invade, as if there's going to be some kind of, of military engagement for Russia as well. Yes. And, be- and, and, that's, and that's part of the problem here is that it's not just about what the data is, it's about how you interpret the data. You know, you can have a headline saying, you know, 30,000 Russian troops are moved to the border and that sounds, and that sounds crazy until it's you ominous. realize that – that 30,000 troops, like, well, what kind of troops are they? What supplies did they bring? Are, you know, is this, is this a normal event? You know, how many troops are on the Russia Ukraine border on a regular basis? You know, I don't have that information. You know what I mean? Like, th- yes, those, yes. all of those things are relevant to how significant 30,000 troops moving towards the border. It's just like, you know, you can find videos showing 
you know, soldiers marching through the snow. And, and it's like, oh, well, that shows all you need to know. It doesn't, doesn't tell you anything. You know what I mean? You need context for all of these things, whether it's videos or individual statistics to gain a better idea of how big the threat actually is. So I totally agree with you, Dan, that I do think that regardless of the actual size of the threat, U.S. media has blown it out of proportion for... You know, for for like, for, for whatever reasons, reasons yeah. yes, for political sure. reasons, for I mean, for for media, it's it's just good news, right? You know right. what I mean? The That's, the potential for for you know war with Russia is that makes a great headline. It doesn't matter how legitimate it has to be because if it blows over, then everyone's relieved. No one's mad, <laughs> you know, at the media companies for for making you scared. You're just happy nothing happened. Yeah, and it so makes, I mean, it's a makes good news it, for the same reason it makes good movies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a win win for everybody, you know. Uh, so it makes sense. It makes sense. It, and 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 my guess would have been, you know, before all the posturing that with Russia moving troops to the border, that they're trying to pressure U- Ukraine because Russia and Ukraine have squabbles on a regular basis, right? And they do even <laughs> have military engagements. And Russia does attack Ukraine to some degree or another. So it's not the most far-fetched thing I've ever heard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I would but I wouldn't have guessed that they were going to launch a full-scale invasion into into Ukraine. I would have guessed that it was something else. Whether that's posturing or whether that's intimidation or whether that's them maybe trying to start some kind of scuffle on the border for political reasons in order to pressure Ukraine into into some kind of an agreement. Right. You highlighted a really interesting fact that we don't tend to, to think about because we're thinking so busy thinking of security from our perspective. Um, Russia may do things because it reflects well to their people, right? They, mm. may, they may flex their muscles occasionally uh, to show people that the Soviet Union, the old, the old glory of the Soviet Union is not entirely gone, right? We're still strong. We're still a world player, um, which is hard to do when you're a second rate economy, when you're, when you're uh, Russia is a lot in a lot of ways like China. The the way they manage their economy makes it extremely unproductive, and there's massive corruption, and there's there's a variety of problems. And as such, they don't they punch well below their weight, which is people don't think that because they punch pretty hard. But they have massive population, they have massive natural resources, um, and uh, and that makes them they they are actually punching well below their weight as a world player because they're just not very effective. They're not very uh, Productive is the word um, in their economy, and as such, they're not as big a player as they could be. Um, so yeah, that's that's Russia in a nutshell. Um, at some point, maybe we'll dig into the the country of Russia itself and talk about it in a way, uh, you know, get into why we think they're uh, they're not as nearly as big a threat as people make them out to be. Um, second big piece of news that we wanted to talk about: the Canada truck convoy. Um, there's this great song. <laughs> I'm trying to remember who it's by. We got a mighty convoy trucking through the night. It's one of those like silly songs. Oh, it's it's beautiful. They have <laughs> what will be a Guinness World Book of Records is already calling it, assuming it makes it, and instead of assuming that the the convoy more or less stays together. Um, when they reach, I believe they're headed to the capital. There, they they reached it. Did they reach it? They okay. reached Moscow. Yeah, it's. You can see video of of. You say of Moscow. The... You're talking about <laughs> Russia, okay? <laughs> wow, they went way further than I thought they were going. <laughs> this is an impressive convoy. For me, it's <laughs> it's just... the it's the ocean crossing that really <laughs> that really, really makes, makes me news. Curious. Yes, this is this is why we're talking about this. They they made it to the Canadian equivalent of Moscow. <laughs> it's Kanaskow, I think, is what it's Kanaskow. called. Is the city. <laughs> Um, they've been putting pressure on it. My favorite news on this subject is satire news, where uh, articles saying things like, uh, <laughs> the socialists are upset that the workers of the world are uniting. <laughs> and Because uh, uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, the prime, prime minister, prime minister, right? They have, a, they have a prime minister. He's not the president. Prime minister, Justin Trudeau. Um, is is a very uh, democratic socialist type of figure. Um, the way he's handled the pandemic has 
the convoy is moving there because they don't like the way he's handled the pandemic. Um, truckers were being forced to wear masks in their truck, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like entirely, entirely worthless if you're in a tiny area, even if you were with people, but <laughs> alone in your truck is beyond me. Um, they were being forced to get vaccines, things like that. Uh, anyway, that, uh, this is going to be the largest convoy ever. It's going to be one of the biggest protests, I think, in Canada, um, set to break all kinds of records. And they just want to be able to get back to work and not have to deal with all these rules. It's pretty straightforward, and maybe maybe it'll do something in Canada. But Canada has been surprisingly united in their fear of COVID and in their uh, mm -hmm. lockdown and things. But yeah, so it's definitely something that that I'm I at least am happy to see. <laughs> yes, good for them. Good for them to push back against this. Uh, workers of the world unite for this purpose. Sounds awesome. Um, third bit of news: Biden cryptocurrency. Biden is Biden is creating his own cryptocurrency. <laughs> yes, the Biden coin. <laughs> it'll feature. It'll feature Joe Biden's face, kind of like the Doge coin, <laughs> which I guess isn't you know isn't even a real coin. So it's just an image <laughs> of a coin with Biden's face on it. Um, Biden is cracking down on cryptocurrency or would like to. Um, we'll see where this goes, how much of this actually goes into effect. Um, cryptocurrency has been going through a bad run. Um, it's, if you followed it at all uh, since we talked about it, it's gone up and down several times based on things like China cracking down on it, governments deciding to regulate it, etc. In particular, he wants to tax exchanges through cryptocurrencies and uh, some other things like that. And of course, that's going to cause the prices to fall. And uh, it's just the way it is with the political tampering and with the the way that's going. Um, we'll see how much of it actually comes into effect. And the fourth thing before we get into the substance of what we want to talk about. Supreme Court, Justice Breyer has announced, maybe he hasn't even announced yet. The news announced that he was retiring. <laughs> Usually how this happens is the Supreme Court announces it. The Supreme Court has a... a a PR arm, right? They say things like what's going on. Um, there was a, there was a scandal some time ago. By some time makes it sound like a long time. Uh, some weeks ago where people were saying, uh, that Justice, uh, Sotomayor, I believe it was, uh, was attending online because Justice Gorsuch wouldn't wear a mask. And this turned out to be entirely false. As far as, as far as we can tell, the Supreme mm -hmm. Court actually came out and made a statement where Justice Gorsuch and Sotomayor said, no, no, that's not <laughs> what's happening. The Supreme Court is a very different body. People don't realize they're actually much closer than like congressmen of opposing parties. They work together mm -hmm. all the time. They're discussing things together all the time. And they have a very professional way of doing that. That is, uh, a remnant from another age in terms of in terms of how politics is politics is usually conducted in the direction it's going now. Um, it, it's interesting. The Supreme Court is an interesting place. Anyway, Breyer's retiring. Biden has said he's going to appoint a black woman to take mm -hmm. his place. Um, if you don't, if you're not familiar with who Breyer is, Breyer is one of the liberal justices, so it'll be a liberal justice being replaced by a liberal justice. Not really. We changing. assume. We assume. Not really changing the makeup much. Um, uh, there were interesting polls talking about what people think of Biden saying it's going to be a black woman first and then looking for further qualifications. Mm -hmm. And it was surprisingly one-sided. It was something like 70%. I don't have the numbers in front of me. But a, a large majority thought this was a bad way to go about finding a new Supreme Court justice. Um, which isn't great, <laughs> isn't a great look. Um, there's a variety of areas where Joe Biden and his administration are hitting these kind of walls where he thinks he's acting in step with uh, with the culture and the direction it's going by by doing these kind of uh, making these kind of uh, politically correct or uh, uh, I don't know, woke for lack of a better word steps. And it's and the polls show that it's even among his his most, uh, even among, you know, hardcore Democrats, 
they're not particularly popular, which which is just going to go down as another thing that has just been Joe Biden's administration. Um, it's been it's been bad from start to finish in ways that are surprising, right? Just just not not good at politics in ways that are just surprising, right? Just in incompetent no, it's, and it's, silly it's, ways. It's true, and and as I mean, as a a liberal president, Biden had a. Ha- could have had a very simple game plan, which is to say, I'm looking at all the Supreme Court nominees and we're going to pick the best one. And then he picks someone who is a black woman yeah. and argues that this is the best one and enlists her qualifications and doesn't emphasize the fact that she's a black woman, but picks a black woman. Like politically, yeah. that would have made sense for Biden. Yeah. His mistake was tipping his hand and making it clear that it wasn't actually about qualifications. It wasn't about anything except for race and gender. Yeah. And, and, and that was the big mistake. It's, it's kind of like when he was talking about Ukraine in a, in a press conference and he was like, you know, we are not going to allow Putin to do this. You know, if it's a small incursion in Ukraine, it's not a huge invasion, you know, that might be a difficult question for us. And and we may not be sure how to respond. You know, he might get away with that. It's the kind of thing where where it's, it's the kind of thing you might say behind doors in a planning meeting, but you don't announce that publicly. And this feels the same way, you know, that yeah. it's it's the kind of thing you you people say behind doors all the time. Politicians say behind doors all the time. And let's be. Let's be real here. This is a this is a game for these people. He's just playing it poorly. He he is playing it poorly. It's it's odd. Affirmative action is hasn't been so unpopular probably since it was implemented. Um the Supreme Court is considering cases on affirmative action right now. Where affirmative action, if you happen to not be familiar with that, is where where they would do things like reserve seats for racial minorities mm-hmm. within universities. They would say, what we want is we want more minorities to get into these positions. And so they would, uh, <laughs> the courts were supposed to enforce this. And how do, how do you enforce this? How do you get it so that they're, you know, the, the, the supposition was that they were being prevented from getting into these places because of their race. Mm-hmm. And so in order to counter that, affirmative action was implemented through the courts. This was not a legislative thing. This was through the Supreme Court in ways that certainly push the limits of what the Supreme Court can and can't do. And uh, they, they basically, to make sure that there was not, the, that no discrimination was happening, they imposed quotas on institutions for the number of people from these minorities. Meaning, mm-hmm. before you could consider qualifications, you had, you had to, to consider, consider race. race. For a vari- for a certain number of seats, right? and so if if what you want is the most qualified people, then to add any other filter is going to give you less qualified people. That's just the way it is. If if you want the best actors in the world, but you also want them to be really good looking, you don't get the best actors in the world. You get the point at which acting and looks meet, right? That's that's American. That's Hollywood in general. Mm-hmm. Like you go look mm-hmm. at actors from other countries; they're not always, they're not nearly so pretty, and they're they're likely better actors relative to their population. You know, in the in the talent levels there. If you were to also mm-hmm. select for looks, you reduce how much acting talent you get, and it's just the way it is. If you're selecting for two things, then you can't get the best of one of those things. Um. And that's exactly what happened with affirmative action. You're selecting for two things and you're not getting the best. Now, now you could say that in a lot of situations, there are so many people qualified and there are mm-hmm. so few seats that adding this selection, they're still going to be within the range. And that's, and that's fair enough. No, and it's probably something you could argue with the Supreme mm-hmm. Court, you know, mm-hmm. that there, there are probably thousands of candidates who qualify to be a Supreme Court justice. There are a mm-hmm. lot of qualified judges out there and, and individuals who are qualified I mean, you know, they've already, as they talk about this, they've already pulled out a bunch of names of black women who could be in the running. You know, these people have the qualifications, so they could be someone Biden's considering. Yes. But when you set it up this way, it definitely, 
it's it's a mistake. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a political it's, mistake. It's a it's, it's, a, it's a, a political thing. mistake. But but even even with yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> as 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 my wife pointed out, imagine how that justice is gonna feel when when she's picked. You know, when she gets that phone call, she's gonna be like, oh. I'm I'm filling a quota for you. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm the affirmative action judge. I'm the one who mm-hmm. may not be qualified. Yeah, and that's and that's maybe how she's known for years. Yeah, yeah. Well, even if she is qualified, and it's just even yeah. if that's what I'm saying, it doesn't it doesn't matter now. She could be the number one candidate, and could have been chosen, you know, and would have been chosen regardless. But it doesn't matter now. No, yeah, that's right. That's right. Because of how it was presented. Um, mm-hmm. To to just say one more thing about that idea of of standards and selecting the best. If you want the best, right, there's there's no – that's different than saying you want people above a certain benchmark. If you want people Mm -hmm. above a certain benchmark, that's fine. But if you want the best, there is one, right? And maybe you can't identify that one, but – But you can try. Right. And so if if a place like Harvard wants the best, then – it can't select for anything else. Now, if, if what you're saying is, as long as you're above this line, you're good, there probably are far more people than they're ever going to be able to take into Harvard, right? Above mm-hmm. that line, and and they can draw from whoever they want. If they want to take a racial quota, um, whatever. But if but it uh it eliminates the the claim that um that they're only taking the best at that point if you're if you're saying above a line. It's two different, and, and two the different honest, types of standards. And the honest answer, Dan, is that beyond affirmative action, I don't think Harvard is just trying to take the best anymore. No, no, they're not. Especially in terms of academics, they 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 get above this line and then they start looking at other factors. Yes, yes. Not just affirmative action, but a whole bunch of other factors. Yes, you know, that- otherwise they'd be more Asian, right, was the, was what some of the, the – the, there was a – a lot of news about them being discriminatory in their practices against Asians, and they would they would rate them low on their on personality. Yeah, because when it comes to academics in the in the U.S., the race that performs the best is yeah Asians. Absolutely, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, uh, I had mentioned that Breyer that people were pressuring Breyer to retire when we talked Supreme Court, mm-hmm. and. And that there's reasons for him to want to retire, even though he's relatively healthy now, right? There's no problems and he can go until he dies. Yeah, there's political reasons for him to retire now. The future does not look good right now for the Democratic Party, the immediate future. And so if he doesn't retire now, midterms may replace enough senators that he can't, that, that Biden can't appoint a liberal justice. Um, and so he's got to do it. He's got to do it soon. And so I, I, he may or may not have already announced his retirement. It is happening. Um, it just wasn't. It was just odd that it was announced that way. No, and and, and it, apparently there was a lot of pressure, and, and his hand was was forced a little bit. There were some so. ruthless articles calling him selfish, and and uh, anyway, yeah, yes. So Anyways, the big news now. Big, or at least the news we want to focus on. <laughs> That's right. All of this is big news. The news we want to focus on is Joe Rogan, at least temporarily. Um, we'll see how long that runs us. That may be all we talk about today. Joe Rogan is all over the news. Um, I've never seen so many articles about Joe Rogan, though he's regularly in the news and regularly mm-hmm. discussed. Um, as just yes, a- the news is regularly discussed by him. <laughs> Badoom, be here for the foreseeable future. Joe Rogan, <laughs> as long as I can keep Not it. after that joke. <laughs> we may be shutting down. <laughs> Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is interesting. I, I don't know. If you're not familiar with him, I don't even know where to start to introduce him to you. Probably Fear Factor. He was, yeah, he was in Fear was, Factor. He was when he peaked. Yeah, that's right. He, he, Getting people to eat profile. spiders, you know. <laughs> That's up. Sorry, peak, I'm not certainly. being helpful at all. That's a peak, certainly. <laughs> Whether it was his absolute peak, uh, certainly debatable. Um, he was when he was young. He did a lot of MMA stuff. Uh, it sounds like, and he, I haven't heard. Uh, I'm not an expert on Joe Rogan. I've listened to a fair amount, but not. <clears throat> you know, I don't uh, follow him. I don't listen to all of his episodes by any by any means. He's got over a thousand of them. <laughs> um, but he's big and eminent. Uh, 
in MMA and did and did uh, uh, fighting when he was younger. I don't remember the the particular style. Um, and as he got older, he's been he's always been around the MMA scene. He was he was uh, called in to to run Fear Factor, and uh, and that certainly helped his profile. And to this day, he commentates MMA fights, the mixed martial arts, um, UFC specifically, um, and probably others, given how big he is. Um, and he does comedy. This is not the combination of things that gets you elected to the Supreme Court. <laughs> this is not the combination of things that gets you elected to Congress. This is, this is a really random assortment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of things where I guess he's funny and he can beat people up. Right? This, this is a weird resume, <laughs> right? <laughs> He started doing podcasts where he was just having conversations with his friends and having conversations with his friends. Um, they would laugh and they would blow smoke and, you know, do what, do whatever. And they started filming them essentially. And this evolved. He would talk to other people and he would, in some ways he was the, uh, the prototype of what podcasting could be. Yeah. And he started, he started podcasting like over a decade ago. Yeah. He's been doing it for a long time. It was, I had no idea podcasting was a thing a decade ago. I had no idea podcasting was really a thing four or five years ago. Uh, for most people, podcasting is, is still novel. I mean, it mm -hmm. will be for some time. It's uh, it takes a while for these things to, to, pick up even though it's wildly popular and growing extremely rapidly. Joe Rogan sits there and often for as long as three hours, he had a recent one with Jordan Peterson that was four hours and almost, it was like four hours and 13 minutes. And they will just talk. And he has the skills of an interviewer developed over a thousand plus <laughs> interviews, essentially. Um, he has the entertainment, you know, he, he can be witty at times. Um, but he's, he's generally very serious and just very curious. Mm -hmm. Um, and over the course of all of those conversations, talking to whoever he thought was interesting, who would also want to talk to him, he has learned all kinds of things and become very, very, very big. Bigger than the, the most, the biggest show on cable news is Carl Tucker. Um, with something like 3 million viewers. Um, beyond that, I know third place was, was Hannity. The five were close. Um, if you didn't know this, Fox News is generally the biggest, uh, is the biggest cable place by a significant margin. And then CNN and these other ones, uh, NBC, the, the more liberal ones are smaller, but there's more of it. Uh, Joe Rogan is so much bigger than any one of those shows. And if you went for unique viewers, like people who are not just added the numbers of people who watch all of the Fox News shows, but different people, he might be bigger than the whole station in terms of how many people listen to him. He's certainly bigger than CNN by himself. Which is nuts. Bigger than MSNBC, right? Bigger than ABC. Uh, possibly bigger than the combination de on some metrics. And it, yeah, it depends on how you count it, right, obviously. Right, right. But but the point is, is that this one individual person, this one individual podcast is, is, is on a level playing field with entire institutions and in fact maybe above them in terms of how hard he can hit, how much influence he has. He is... As, a, as an individual, he is probably the most powerful news personality. I don't, know, I don't even know how to categorize him, right? Because he talks about, he'll talk about comedy, he'll talk about fighting, mm -hmm. he'll talk about, <laughs> he'll talk politics, he'll talk COVID, right? Which is what's gotten him into, what's gotten the, the news attention on him now. He is, whatever he is, he's the most influential in a variety of spheres that has perhaps ever been in the, in, world history as if anything before modern news would compare anyway but <laughs> in terms of influence right it, like it, truly singular in his reach and this is why when people push back against him and act like act like they can control the narrative it's just silly 
he can he controls the narrative far more than most of these groups can. Um, which puts By the in way, a strange place. I don't. I want to push back a little bit. Please. I think that he may be singular in the numbers, but I don't think this kind of influence is unique. That I think this does happen on a on a regular basis, where you have someone that people turn to. A good example of this, I think, would be Oprah Winfrey. That for a long time, she was the most influential person in the United States, just like Joe Rogan is now, and had that kind of reach. Yes, and that kind of fair. influence where where everyone knew what Oprah was saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and and I think that's something that you could go back and look through time where you have people. I mean, you go back a hundred years ago and it would be it would be a news anchor. You know what I mean? It would be the most popular news anchor. Yes. You know, I think mm-hmm. back to like Tom Brokaw as as I can't remember if he's a news anchor, but you know, as as someone who was like, you know, he's on regular cable mm-hmm. television, mm-hmm. but that's what everyone like watched back then. Watch people, show. Yes. Everyone mm-hmm. would watch his show. Yeah, and, yeah, mm-hmm. and you and you may be and that's a that's a further good qualification that, that there may be an been a time where because of the narrowness of the range, you know, the, there, few, the, the numbers few were higher. The numbers yes. would have been higher in the percentage of the population. Would be higher. That's true. So, so I wouldn't say good, that, good that what Joe Rogan is doing is unique through history. I'd say it's unique for right now, though, that, he, that right now, yes. especially because what's unique about him is that right now you have so many other options that this is a this is a, a world where single individuals don't hold that much influence. But Joe Rogan does. Yes, yes, and, and if anything, people are fracturing more, and so that they're mm-hmm. they're moving to smaller groups rather than to mm-hmm. larger groups. Exactly. And yes, thank you. Those are those are. I think those qualifications are exactly right. I can carry it away in my hyperbole and trying to impress people with Joe Rogan, mm-hmm. <laughs> but he he is he still is impressive. impressive. Like though, yeah, I'm not saying he's not impressive. <laughs> no, he is. He is. And, to and, be able to draw in <clears throat> millions of listeners to listen to a three-hour conversation on a regular basis yes. is nuts. I think the average recently is something like 11 million. And you have to, and you have to go through Spotify to get to it, which, is, wild. which is another limiter. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, so Joe Rogan has been in the news because he talked to Malone. What's his first name? He talked to Malone. Robert Malone, Peter McCullough are are the two big are the ones. Two he's talked ones to, that to he's talked to to Brett in the past. Yes, he's talked to a lot of people about COVID over the over the COVID this over the COVID past experience, two years. Um, including including more mainstream voices. Um, but recently, he talked to those two uh, and. Right now, it's just such a strange thing. So all the news organizations are trying to take him down. You'll see articles from CNN, or articles from ABC, articles from Politico. You'll see articles from just about everybody who are dogpiling on to this thing. What happened is uh, it started with Neil Young, who is an old rocker. Um, I don't. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not even going to confess my ignorance here. Let's just I'll say. confess, I, I don't even know who Neil Young is. <laughs> I, no I had is. never heard of Neil Young before this. I don't know who Neil Young is. Un- ironically, and I can't listen to him now because he's not on Spotify, so I'll never know. You'll never know. Ironically, <laughs> Joe Rogan was a uh, was security when he was 19 years old at a at a concert for this. He talks about it, and <laughs> recently when he heard that Neil Young was pulling from Spotify, that's funny. It, it is. He quit because it was a terrible experience. He wasn't going to get beat up for 15 bucks an hour. Anyway, Neil Young said, I'm going to pull my music from Spotify if you don't get Joe Rogan under control, essentially. Joe Rogan, uh, the opinions expressed by those individuals Brad mentioned on COVID are far from mainstream, though they're rapidly becoming mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were fringe two years ago. In a year, they're going to be the majority opinion. They're already mm. probably the majority opinion. They're going to be the vast majority opinion. Yeah, many, many things that, that were said, especially recently by, like, for example, Robert Malone, mm-hmm. quickly leaked into mainstream narratives. Like, an example is when Robert Malone was talking about the financial incentives and the fact that hospitals were potentially misreporting the numbers, you mm-hmm. know, weren't differentiating between 
COVID infections of people who were just there for other things versus people who were hospitalized because of COVID. And then next thing you know, two weeks later, Fauci is 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 making statements about how, well, it's very important you differentiate between these two things. <laughs> it's like, careful, Fauci, you don't want Neil Young to, to protest you. Yeah. Yeah. Joe Rogan in his in some in the, his statement in which he addresses the controversy that's been happening mentions four specific things like the lab leak theory and areas in which the 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 mainstream CDC organization and CDC following organizations have all been uh have been wrong mm-hmm. and obviously wrong and, and now at this point it's admitted things like the effectiveness of cloth masks the the lab leak theory uh, the fact that this is going to be endemic and that uh, trying to strive for zero cases is a is a pipe dream, and that, that mm-hmm. you're going to have to learn to live with this being present. Uh, the the effect of of a vaccine, how immune you are to Delta and then Omicron if you're vaccinated, right? The effects of that on the spread, the fact that it's going to spread anyway, and that you can't actually prevent that. Um, these these kind of things that that have been facts all along, um, but that the main that the CDC and others were blind to. A lot of the way that they got into the public narrative seems to be through Joe Rogan, right? He seems to be doing these right. He does these, the tide turns, and then bam, Neil Young and company push back for false COVID information. Now, are some of the claims in those episodes, in those three hour conversations where, you know, 200 claims about COVID are made, are some of them going to be false? Absolutely. Mm hmm. And the people who did those would be the first to say that. Joe Rogan, Malone, right? These people are not stupid. And they're not, they're making these based on evidence that they have. As the further evidence comes forward, they would change their opinions in a heartbeat. And that's that they're having live conversations in which they're talking about these things Mm -hmm. um, with the best Mm -hmm. information they have available, right? For the same reason that the CDC can be wrong about things, of course, these people can be wrong about things. And yet, Spotify is under immense pressure. Seemingly uh, from all quarters to censor Joe Rogan or to modify these or to take these particular episodes down and so on. And what's what's really interesting is when we when we're talking about misinformation here, we need to be clear because. Really, Joe Rogan is not being attacked for what he said, he's being attacked for allowing other people to say things in these conversations. In other mm-hmm. words, he's being attacked for creating a platform that allows people to say things that certain individual certain organizations like the CDC deem inaccurate, mm-hmm. which as Dan's already pointed out seems insane to be trusting the CDC, but that's besides the point. Even if the CDC was correct, the thing is is Joe Rogan is not going on this podcast and saying, "Here's what you need to know, this this and that." And those things are all misinformation. He's saying, let's have a conversation with these individuals. He's creating a a space for them because there aren't many spaces left. You know, YouTube's taking them down. Twitter's taking them down. You know, these people are banned everywhere they walk. Everywhere they try and open their mouths, they get shut down. And one of the few places they're able to, to speak freely is on podcasts. And Joe Rogan is one of those podcasts that give them that platform. And for that, for his encouragement of free speech is why he's being, you know, is being attacked just straight up. Yeah. Yeah. It's the idea, what do they say? The plat. He's giving them a platform and mm-hmm. Spotify is giving him a platform mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or so they say, right? That's actually backwards. This is a mutually agreeable deal between Spotify and Joe Rogan. Mm-hmm. Joe Rogan doesn't need Spotify. Mm-hmm. He was massive before Spotify. He will be massive after. Mm-hmm. Um, but for now, it is through Spotify. Um, and all of this pushback is actually having an effect, unfortunately. Um, there's been pushback against Joe Rogan for forever. Um, but this is actually having an effect. Spotify is changing some things. Uh, they've, they've given a few inches at least. Um, and mm-hmm. as they, as if the pressure continues to mount, more people jump on, um, it's entirely possible they cave. Um, if they do, it would be, it would be a real tragedy. This would be mm-hmm. not, not for Joe Rogan, probably. Joe Rogan would probably no, Joe leave. Rogan is big enough that he could survive mm-hmm. 
having to move his platform off of Spotify. Yeah, he survived moving it onto there, right? And restricting mm-hmm. it. It had, been a, it had been everywhere. It had been really convenient to get to. He survived mm-hmm. restricting it, making you go through Spotify. Um, he'll survive leaving again. Now, there are a lot of inconveniences. I was, I was listening to someone break this down. We take for granted the fact that, that Brad and I can go and make a podcast and people can listen to it everywhere, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. If we were getting millions of listens, everything mm-hmm. changes. Mm-hmm. You, you actually, at that point, to run that kind of traffic, you actually need a back end. You need uh, servers. You need, you need all kinds of things. You need to be, uh, you know, this is a full scale, um, large internet. That's a huge amount of internet traffic. Mm-hmm. And so if Joe Rogan tried to do his own thing, it's entirely possible that between Amazon and Google and others, they could, they could make it really, really difficult. Well, and, and I think they could, they could make it difficult, but I don't think they could stop it because there are so many other podcasting platforms because there are so many normal people who listen to podcasts on random platforms. Yes. You know what I mean? That's, Mm -hmm. Spotify does not control podcasting. Google Podcasts, you know, most of these of these platforms only hold a small fraction. And so even if Google, Amazon, and Spotify all ban Joe Rogan, he would be just fine. And I don't think they all would. I don't think I don't think that would happen. I really don't. I think that's because I think part of the problem is that if they did that, it would be the death of their podcasting platforms. Because <laughs> wherever would. Joe Rogan ended up would, would gain be, would a get huge bigger. market share. Yes, yes. No, you're absolutely right. My fear would uh, the fear would be uh, would be a little further that the Amazon and Google would take it further than that. So Amazon and Google, between the two of them, own a massive amount. Or what's the word? Own is the wrong word. They control the flow of traffic in a massive amount of the internet even when it's not to their websites. Mm-hmm. And even, even when you're not dealing with them directly and you have no idea, Google may actually be running things behind the scenes or Amazon. Um, and the, the clearest, when this was made really clear, is when you had, uh, what, was the, what was the platform it was aimed to, it meant to compete with Facebook and it was growing in popularity. Man, they were so effective, I can't remember the name. You can't remember their name. I know what you're talking about, and I can't remember either. It was, it was, uh, it was removed. It was, it disappeared one day because Google, I believe it was Google specifically, pulled the plug on back end stuff, right? Uh, being able to, uh, run, uh, the servers that run it and, and, and deal with things like, uh, basic security, internet security and things. It was at that mm-hmm. level. That they took it, that they attacked it and, and had it removed. And then you had a, a unanimous front from Google, Amazon, and then I want to say a few other big names that do this, that, that do something like, you know, do a very high percentage of internet traffic, um, through their various services and back end things such that this website could not restart. Mm hmm. Until they uh, eventually they found someone I think who would who would run all the back end stuff and make it work, and and then they were able to eventually come online. And at that point, it was too late in a lot of ways. Their moment's mm-hmm. gone. I we can't even remember their name, and this wasn't even that. Long no, ago. and and I I understand what what you're saying with that now. I understand the 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 level you're talking about, and I I don't think you couldn't close I, Joe Rogan. Yeah. yeah, I I don't think that's the, that's the fear to be most worried about. No. I think what's to be most worried about is is not the closing of Joe Rogan, not the shutting down of Joe Rogan, but the uh, the tempering of Joe Rogan. What makes Joe Rogan so good is the fact that he says whatever he wants, that he invites people on, and invites all sorts of people on, <laughs> and and so what what I'm most worried about is that Spotify pressures him and he, he caves, caves into that pressure 
because that's what would cost us. That's what would cost him the integrity of his show. Only Joe Rogan can bring down Joe Rogan is basically what I'm saying. At this point, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I brought that up because someone was pointing out that it, it, it actually may be more complicated than him just leaving Spotify, right? It could be, it could be uh, depending on how, uh, how far they take this, uh, this attack and how, how many people are involved, you know, how many players. And it's looking like there are, there's a lot of actual uh, serious players in the background of this. This isn't merely, and, and this should make mm-hmm. perfect sense. Spotify owns a massive portion, has a, has a massive market share of music and other streaming things like that, audio streaming. And groups like Amazon have a tiny percentage and would mm-hmm. like more. And so mm-hmm. for Neil Young leaves and a short time later, right, his music's pulled from Spotify. A short time later, he's offering a four month, I think it's four months free trial on Amazon. Mm-hmm. This, this, there's there's obviously business incentives here and political incentives here. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're absolutely right that I think the worst case scenario would be Joe Rogan bends and says, I'm going to do my show differently and not have these kind of conversations or for, he already suggested to some degree that he would, that he would have mainstream people after these people. Which, which, for the record, is a little bit silly because he's had mainstream <laughs> yeah, people. Is. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't it that long ago that he had Doctor Gupta from CNN right yes. on on his show, and so so that's the thing is his his video his video uh, addressing it. You know, his not necessarily an apology video, but whatever you want to call it, it his statement on it was not was not terrible, but it did have a little hint of. Of apology, of you know what, maybe I will temper my podcast, and and it just depends on on what he meant by that, you know. It and it's it's more concerning than anything else. It doesn't really mean anything's yes, changed. Yes. It's just a little concerning because because that's how it always starts, you know. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're right that you're right to point out that that particular phrase when he says I will have mainstream opinions come after and talk to them. That if anything, that well, first off, first off, those people previously refused to come. Mm-hmm. Right? The reason he doesn't have them is because they won't come on and have discussions like this with Joe Rogan. <laughs> Sanjay Gupta, Gupta may or may not want to come back onto Joe Rogan. Like yeah, because it didn't go well. It didn't go well in terms of him covering the the mainstream narrative. He would say something, mm-hmm. and Joe Rogan would press him on it, and he'd. Yeah, deflect. that interview made CNN look worse. <laughs> it did. By the time the three hours was over, like, people listening to that were not were not convinced that CNN was the good guy. No, they weren't. And then CNN tried to have him on and on one of their shows and like pin him down and be like, "No, we weren't. We weren't lying about this stuff. We weren't being deceptive. We weren't wrong about this." And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the car alarm just went off near me. That's a wonderful background noise. Fantastic. I it's, love it. It's beautiful. It's just stressing the urgency of, of our conversation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute my mic. So you're saying I have to carry the conversation, Dan? This is terrible. I would like to apologize to the audience. I would like to apologize to our fans. I would like to apologize to the Academy because <laughs> the this Academy. is unfair Your for mom. anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's gone. Um Thank uh, goodness. That was close. I was oh, I was gonna say, if if what happens is mainstream people see this and they'll go, yeah, I want to be the one that comes on after and talks to Joe Rogan and sets the record straight, that could be the best thing that happens. Absolutely. Because because Joe Rogan would push them and they would and they would be they would not be able to simply deflect. You can't sit in a room with someone for three hours and not answer a question. And right? not talk, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and only stick to three Yes. To three, uh, three catchphrases. Yeah. Yeah. Half of the problem with the COVID, with why the COVID. And, and there is a real argument to be made for tempering some of the things that are being said by yes. the, by the people he's had on. Right. Like we've said, not everything they say is correct. And so to have someone else on and be like, yeah, this is, that's too yeah, far. I can say you know, this you- specifically is mm-hmm. wrong. Mm-hmm. 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 Absolutely. Cause that's what Joe Rogan does. They'd say the person you had on was wrong and he'd go about what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And they'd go about COVID, and he'd be like, "What part of COVID?" Because right <laughs> now, yeah, everyone talks about how 
how the problem is misinformation. It's like, okay, well, what misinformation specifically? Specifically, yes. Like, let's break it down. Because if the misinformation is a huge problem and 11 million people heard that misinformation and now believe it, let's go ahead and clarify. Let's have some some fact-checking here. Please and let's break it. it down and and see where they're wrong. You can't just keep throwing around misinformation and not explaining it. Yeah, we you you were specifically looking through articles trying to find what they deemed misinformation. Yeah, and I finally found one that that fact checked the Joe Rogan podcast, and I was like, "Ooh, good." And I'm like, "Wait, which podcast?" No, the whole podcast. Just just Joe Rogan in general. Just Joe Rogan about <laughs> COVID, and they only had four things to fact check. And I was like, even if they were right about all four of these things, which I'm not sure they were. It was ridiculous, as you yeah, said, what, what the, the number of claims that have been made about COVID in each individual episode. And you're saying that you look through, you know, maybe 10 different episodes on COVID and you only found four things that were wrong. Yeah, four things that were even worth <laughs> fact checking. They're doing amazing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> this is the most that accurate. Beast, that beats most other, uh, you know. Corrections made by major news agencies where they say something blatantly wrong and yeah. then go back and quietly correct it. Yeah, seriously, it's a it's a strange thing. I would I would love for Malone to be in a room with someone who thinks that he's wrong about everything and to let them talk. And if and mm-hmm. if we can't have that, I would love to have Malone in a room with Joe Rogan and then Joe Rogan in the room with the other person. Right? Mm-hmm. Let them, let Joe Rogan be a mediator if that's if they think that's so much better. Um, it would, in either case, it would blow people's minds and they would come away with all kinds of, of things they now know about COVID that they should have known a year ago. Mm -hmm. And we probably Mm -hmm. all should have known two years ago if this had been Mm -hmm. handled properly. And we actually were having conversations and then about the research and about the data and about the so on. It's just, yeah, it's a really interesting place because he does apologize. He does say, I'm sorry for those of you who are who were what, upset or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't think he will bend. I don't think he will bend. I can't imagine that he does. Spotify, on the other hand, has been leaking value for some time now. Their their stock has been kind of up and down the last year. Yeah, um, there there's I I when you mentioned it, I went ahead and pulled it up, and their stock has been dropping since before. Before, before the scandal. the Joe Rogan before scandal, because like this scandal. scandal broke last week, mm-hmm. and when it broke last week, you were halfway down a down a slope, a steep slope, yeah, not a steep slope. To to say that it's, I mean, tanking yeah, it, is right, it's not right. tanking, tanking, it's tanking just going down. Strong. Tanking is yeah. too strong. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's going down. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been. It's they, definitely not good. Like like if you look at it for the past six yeah. months, yeah, it's not it's not doing great. Yeah, they've been losing market share to others, which mm-hmm. isn't that surprising. They're massive. No, it's not. And there are a lot of competitors who are trying to and are successfully stealing small amounts, each of them. Mm-hmm. Right? Each of them are chipping away at it. Um, and it's going to be very hard for them to hold on to even the size they still have. And they're probably going to continue to leak for a while, I would guess. No, and it's the same problem you have with with most streaming services right now whether it's mm-hmm. music or video is there Netflix right anyone yeah. can anyone can compete and so it's hard to it's hard to hold on to that yeah Netflix is a great example where Netflix used to be the king and now while they're still like Spotify you know dominating they're not not to the same degree it's yes. not quite so clear they're anymore they're not the game in town with a few and others obviously you might it add. makes mm-hmm. sense why that would make investors a little wary yes Yes. Um, and, and why they would seize, why the competitive companies would seize this opportunity to hammer to Joe and, Rogan because yeah, through and, him you hammer Spotify or to hammer Spotify for hosting Joe Rogan. You know, you get, you get the political and the, and the business, uh, all working all, to your own benefit. Which is how politics is supposed to work anyways. That's, that's nothing new. This mm-hmm. is not a, a unique concept here. No, it's uh, it's unique and it's 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 not it's rare that it's this level of intensity, um, mm-hmm. when it's always been kind of a steady burn on Rogan. Absolutely. 
with that, we probably better save what we were going to. <laughs> what I thought this episode was going to be about was going to come next. <laughs> but having spent uh, already 50 minutes-ish, uh, 55, this seems like a decent time to call it. Anything else you want to add? Yeah, you want to you wanna drop a teaser for what you want to talk about? Yeah, let's do. Let's, let's talk about it. So there... In some because ways, it, it goes it, does it goes along it with what relate. we're talking about. It You're does. Right. You're right. So here's a teaser. Here's here's what I wanted to talk about. Um, the I've been really really caught up in. Uh, it it was started by uh, maybe people who want to listen to this, but before we get into it, uh, what really caught my attention was a a podcast between Michaela Peterson, Jordan Peterson's daughter, and James O'Keefe. Um, and he was James O'Keefe is the head of the Project Veritas. Um, started it, CEO, and uh, uh, you know, really responsible for the whole thing. Um, though at this point, they have a large team and a lot of resources. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it's much bigger than just him now, but still the heart and soul of it in a lot of ways. Um, and in that podcast, they referenced a conversation James O'Keefe had with Eric Weinstein. Eric Weinstein is the brother of Brett Weinstein. Um, we don't mention him as much or listen to him as much. He, I don't think he's doing episodes anymore. He used to have a podcast titled The Portal. Um, and he's a really interesting guy, very different in his mannerisms and style than Brett. Extremely intelligent. Um, he was a mathematician of some renown for a while uh, before he got on the wrong side of, of political debates. Um, he really pushes... James O'Keefe on the methods of the Project Veritas. If you're not familiar with them, they initially cut their teeth by doing, uh, people call it muckraking. They do by doing hardcore undercover investigative journalism, uh, spy level stuff, legal, but, but really, uh, really on that line. Right. Mm -hmm. And certainly on the line of how, of what people are comfortable with, you know, hidden cameras, recording people, gaining trust, uh, and then uh, after they've got what they've come, they, you know, they release the story and a lot of people, uh, <laughs> people lose their jobs because they, uh, they, they were caught on camera saying things about how their company works. Um, and this happened in a variety of places. I'll, just one quick story of them um, to set this up was uh, ABC. Uh, this is one of the ones that, that was the most shocking to me. Three years before Jeffrey Epstein uh, came forward, came forward before he was caught. <laughs> Guys, I've been blackmailing everybody. <laughs> I, I wish he'd come forward and just been like, look, here's who's involved. Maybe at that point it wouldn't have been worth, worth assassinating him in his jail cell. Um, but anyway, Jeffrey Epstein, right? The, 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 the uh, pedophile had the island associated with the, with, all kinds of political figures and British mm-hmm. royalty. Um, ABC had a, uh, a journalist, we may go into more detail on this later um, in that next episode, had a journalist who was going to break the story three years earlier before, before it all came out and he was arrested and then assassinated. Um, and they had all kinds of things on him. You know, they had a woman who had pictures and, and was saying he, what he had done to her and all these people who were involved and tying all these political figures together, right? They were about to, she was about to break this story and was told by higher ups not to. And when the story did break, someone recorded her on a, on a hot mic, um, presumably that she had, you know, wasn't aware it was on, right? That's the idea of the hot mic. So the microphone was on and she was off the set and she was mm-hmm. so frustrated. Because she's like, I had this story, right? She would have been, she would have been really famous. This would have been a big deal. Mm-hmm. This would have been mm-hmm. career making, and she and it had been squashed by, uh, squashed by the ABC executives, right? And this was a big reveal to be like, wait a second, ABC was covering for the Epstein's for some reason, right? Said so this wasn't mm-hmm. that important. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows, and you can you can go and you can look up the Project Veritas uh, report on this and listen to the recording yourself and uh, and see what you make of it. This is one of hundreds at this point, probably. I don't, I don't know how many they actually have, but lots and lots, lots more than I've heard of as I was scanning through their, their archive. 
And at this point, their, their business has changed more towards whistleblowing and different things because they become big enough that now insiders are coming to them, right? They don't have to do the investigative journalism side or the, or the quite the level of deception where they have to actually uh, integrate themselves, you know, and ingratiate themselves with people. So all of that uh, is discussed in this, and Eric Weinstein really pushes O'Keefe on this, on his methods and on how, what it looks like to people when they're recording someone in a bar, just some dude who's maybe a little drunk and is running his mouth, and, and how frightening that is in terms of privacy. And that is legal. And the, the circumstances, uh, Project Veritas is above board on following the law and being, being on the right side of, of privacy laws. But it mm-hmm. brings up a lot of interesting questions about privacy and about how I mean, how do you, how do you, audience members, how do you feel about the idea that anybody in the, in the bar may be recording you, right? You're starting to say something you shouldn't, or you're in some other public circumstance, right? And you're, you're, you're venting about work or you're talking about somebody, right? Something comes up that isn't, it isn't your best moment. Mm -hmm. Somebody could be filming you. And that, that makes a lot of people really, really uncomfortable. And so we wanted to get into kind of journalism in general and, and privacy rights and discuss, you know, where, where the lines of justice are here, where, where government should be involved and where, uh, where other things may, may be the solution to that discomfort, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's really interesting stuff and I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah. And tying that in with, with the overall role of journalism and how journalism has changed yes. in the past. Yes. And then also very recently, which ties into, to Joe Rogan, other podcasts and, yes. and other platforms and how they're transitioning. What's necessary to counter the corruption when the journalists begin to protect the institutions instead of, instead mm-hmm. of, uh, speak, as they say, speak truth to power, right? Instead of, instead mm-hmm. of, uh, be the threat to the power, the corrupt powers, they start running cover for them. It's a it's a very interesting question, and and he's certainly at the edge of of he, it's legal, but uh, he's at the edge of uh, of what um, I guess of all the ways that you could attempt to address this with people like you know have from having honest conversations on one hand to having just better reporting. He's like, no, what we need is we need to get them confessing, and we need to mm-hmm. tear the you know rip the <laughs> rip the. Ve- tear the veil and and see behind the curtain and uh, and really get in there and and there's going to be some collateral damage. It's a it's a very different perspective and we wanted to explore it a little bit. We hope we we'll, to see you then. With that, thank you for listening. This has been an episode of Rethinking Politics. You can find us on all of the major podcasting apps or on YouTube. You can reach out to us at rethinkingpoliticspodcast at gmail.com or you can visit our website at rethinkingpolitics.podbean.com where you can support us via Patreon. Thanks and have a wonderful day.